If you're visiting with us, welcome. My name is Edgar Aponta, and one of the pastors here. Uh, to, the, to this one at the screen, so normally on Wednesday, we, if you're visiting with us, we just do a Bible study. Today I will do a very brief Bible study, maybe 10, 15 minutes, as we continue to the book of Romans. Let's pray together and ask the Lord to bless this time. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we praise you and worship you for your grace and mercy in Christ. Thank you for the truth of the gospel, the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We pray for these children. We pray, Father, that the scriptures that they memorized, the songs that they learned, I pray that you will use those to transform them, to draw them to yourself. I pray that all of them, those who do not know you yet, all of them will come to a saving knowledge in Christ Jesus. And I pray that you will use them, even as an encouragement to their parents, that their parents will see the goodness of God in and through them. Lord, bless us as we continue to the book of Romans. Thank you for your grace. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, welcome. This is a different background today. Uh, if you have a Bible, please go to the book of Romans. Normally we'll take a few verses and unpack in a Bible study. Today it will be more like a brief Bible study as we take three verses from the book of Romans and we unpack the meaning of this. So last week, Pastor, two weeks ago, I went through Romans 4, 1 through 12. Last week, Pastor uh, Brendan went through 12 to 16, and today we'll go through verses 17 and 18. You know what is interesting, Danny? I'm just watching you. I remember. It just hit me. It was last year, this Wednesday, last year, that you were invited by them, when I ask you, you say, I forgot their names. I know my son is friend with their child. And you came to watch their, your son's friend to sing, who was a first grader. And I shared a devotional about entrusting the gospel to the next generation. And I presented the gospel for 10 minutes. And I remember that day you came here. When the children were singing after the service, in tears, shaking, and he said, I want to give my life to Jesus. And it just hit me. It was last year. Praise God for his grace. <laughs> Can you stand up so that they will see you, Danny? Can you stand up? Danny came. This is so neat. <laughs> Danny came. He said, like, I need to talk with you. I said, of course. I said, I want to give my life to Jesus. I need to be saved. I need Jesus Christ. And then he got saved that day. We prayed. And then I baptized him. I came to his house. I visited with him. And then he said, Pastor, I've been convicted of my sins. My wife and I, we are actually boy, girlfriend and boyfriend. We have now been married. And I know that's not right before the Lord. I want to confess, and I want to do what is right. Can you marry us? And I say, of course, let's do it next week. So we did it. Luisa, it's so great to have you. And just to see you every Sunday, every Wednesday since then here is such an encouragement and a reminder of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So great to see you. That was not part of this message, so let's jump into this. <laughs> So if you have a Bible, please go to Romans chapter 4, and let's read verses 16 through 18. Romans chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. And it reads, That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom you believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Verse 18, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he has been told. So you shall 
so shall your offspring be. So this is what I have. So in, in verse 16, and, and we saw this last week, just to give you a summary. In the previous verses, Paul is arguing with the Jewish Christians that some of them were confused about salvation. And some of them thought that Abraham was justified by the works of the circumcision. And Paul said to them, said, guys, if you read the Bible well, you will realize that that is wrong. Because he was justified before the sign of circumcision was given to him. In one sense, I mean, he, he doesn't use chapter and verses because they don't have those in the Bible in the first century. But he said, he was justified when he trusted God, which is in Genesis 15. And the circumcision came in Genesis 17. Therefore, he was made righteous, just before God, before circumcision was given. But then he goes on to the law, which we see here in verse 16. I said, but what about the law? We are justified by the law. I said, no way. Abraham was justified before the law was given. He was justified centuries before the law was given to Moses. So that he will be the father of all who will believe, those under the law and those without the law. Because salvation has always been by faith in God. And that is the context. And then we jump here in verses 17 and 18. And this is the message that these two verses are teaching us. Verses 17 and 18. This is the message. Saving faith produces an unbreakable hope in the power and character of God. Saving faith produces an unbreakable hope in the power and character of God. Trust God and hope in Him. See with me verses 17 and 18. This is what we have here. He says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, he says here. And that is in quote, because he's quoting the Old Testament. In the presence of the God in whom he, that's Abraham, believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. And then in verse 18 he says, In hope he, that's Abraham, believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall offspring be. What Paul is doing here, he's quoting the Old Testament. And he says, I have made you the father of many nations. That is coming from uh, Genesis 17. In whom he believes. Who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So it is always reasonable to trust the trustworthy. And there's nobody more trustworthy than God. And Abraham knew this. Before we are in a position to believe God's promises, we need to be sure of both his power, he's able to keep them, and his character. So what we see here is that God is not only powerful, but he's also good. That he's not only good, but also powerful. Because he's powerful, but not good, how can you trust him? Well, if he's good, but not powerful, we cannot trust him because he has good intention, but he can do nothing about it. But in the case of God, he's both powerful and good. He can do what he promises, and he would do it because he is faithful and good. And here, the two points that we see in verse 17, he says, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, He's talking about creation and resurrection. The God who gives life to the dead and he calls into existence the things that do not exist. The point here is God promised to Abraham that he will be the father of many nations. But the challenge with that is that when God gave that promise to Abraham, Abraham had no children, not even one. But it's not only that he doesn't have children, it is that he is 90 years old. And he is, and later, if you read the book of Genesis, he and his wife are laughing about it. Because as, as you can imagine, when you are 90, most likely you are not having children. And this, God says, 
I will give life and call into existence the things that are not. Because God is able to create life when there is not life. And Abraham says, my body was as good as dead. But God, in his power, gave life to his body. He's bringing life to Abraham so that he will see that his promises will come to pass. And that's what we see in verse 18. In verse 18, we read here, in hope, he believed against hope. That's a quite interesting expression. In hope, he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall offspring be. And this is what is going on. He's quoting here two passages, one Genesis 15 and one Genesis 17. He says in Genesis 15, and he brought him outside and said, look toward the heavens and number the stars, if you're able to number them. Then he said, so shall offspring be. You see how many stars are there? You have as many children as you see the stars. And then he says in, verse 17, in chapter 17, no longer will you be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. So God says, Abraham, you have nothing, but I will make something out of you. There's no life within you, but I will give you life. You don't have children, but I will give you nations to you. Because God is able to do that. And the Bible says, and Abraham believed, Genesis 15, 6, and he believed the Lord, and the Lord here, he counted it, his faith, to him as righteousness. So Abraham was made righteous because he believed God. Not because Abraham was perfect. Not because Abraham obeyed the law. There was no law to obey. But he was made righteous because he trusted God. So Abraham was saved through faith by the grace of God because he trusted God. I love how this passage is also alluded and quoted in Luke 1. The moment you believe in God, you must reject the impossible. With God, there's nothing impossible. A woman in her 90s was able to conceive. And this is the same expression that is used in Genesis 18, that is used in Luke 1, when Gabriel appeared to Mary. And Gabriel said, nothing will be impossible with God. Whenever we find ourselves asking, how will it be? The question is, are we trusting the Lord? Here I have some questions to ask you this, this evening as we come to a conclusion. Let's come back. How will it be, Lord? If you are struggling today, Lord, there's no way for this to be possible. How can this happen? For example, you're asking some of these questions. How will I overcome this trial? How will I endure the next few days? How will your promises be fulfilled, O oh Lord? How can you bring good out of this suffering? How will you, will my unbelieving children be saved when they are so far from you, O oh God? Some of you are asking those questions. I know members of our church who are asking the Lord, Lord, how will my unbelieving children be saved when they are so far from you? How can my husband change after all he has done? How can my wife change after all she has done? How can, can I have joy when nothing seems to work? How can this much sin be forgiven? And I remember that was the question that you had. How can this much sin be forgiven? How can I have hope? And the question is, Abraham had no reason to have hope that he would have children. 
His body was good as dead. He has no children. And God said, Abraham, I will bring nations from you. I will make you the father of many nations. Believers like us will come from you. But he trusted God. And he hoped against hope. I love what it says in Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And at the point of time, I will return to you about this, this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Is anything too hard, too difficult for the Lord? Look, the angel quoted this passage to Mary when he said, Behold, your relative Elizabeth in an old age has also conceived a son. This is the sixth, sixth month with her, with, with her who has called barren. What an awful word, barren, dead. And now she has a child. For nothing will be impossible with God. And this is the point that God is communicating in verse 18 here in Romans 8. I love how the New Living Translation translates that. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Why? Because hope is grounded for the believer in the character and power of God. There's a distinction between hope, biblical hope, and wishful thinking. And I think we tend to confuse the two. For example, until a few weeks ago, I was hoping that the Lakers would make it to the NBA Finals. But with the team that they had, it was just wishful thinking. Many of us are hoping that the Rays will win a championship. Right now, it does not look good. But it, that's how we think. But for example, let's say that the Rays, I think they're the last right now in the division in the American League. Let's say that they, are, they hit a great strike for the next 25 games, and they win 25 games in a row. We will say, now we have hope that they can go to the World Series. But what about after those 25 games, they start losing again? Then the hope will go down. Why? Because human hope is always grounded in circumstances, in how well or how not well we are doing at that point. But biblical hope is unbreakable because it's grounded in the character of the God who created the universe. In the God who created us out of nothing. In the God who said, there be light and there was light. In the God who called the dead into life. The God who speaks to dead bonds and those dead bonds becomes human beings. The God who called us through the Holy Spirit and gave us life when we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Because the God of the Bible, the true living God, is powerful and good, we can hope even when we have no reason to hope. So perhaps you're here this evening, and you came, and you're struggling because your son has rejected the faith, because your daughter has walked away from Jesus. I tell you from this passage, hope in the Lord, because he's powerful and he is good. Perhaps your marriage is not in a good place right now. Hope in God. Because if God can raise the dead, he can give you hope and fix your marriage. But only in God. You and I don't have the power to do that. We don't have the power to change reality. But the God who created everything 
can give life when there is not, and he can raise the dead. If you're a Christian here, you should keep this in mind. If God saved you from your sins, he can save anyone. If he saved me, he can save anyone. We were dead in our sins and trespasses, far from him. I remember when I became a Christian, I didn't have one friend who was a believer. I was far from God. I had no interest in God. I was not looking for him. But he said his affection and his grace, and he showed me my need of him, my sin, and he gave me life as I came to Jesus and trusted in Jesus. So if you're here and you're not a Christian, perhaps you came because you wanted to see one of your uh, friend's children. Let me tell you, there is hope for you. The God of the universe, in his grace and mercy, sent Jesus, the Son of God, the one who created you and for whom you were created. But you rejected him. You rebelled against him. We all have sinned against God. And we deserve the judgment of God, the punishment of God. The wages of sin is death. But in his great love and mercy, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life that you and I should have lived, but we did not. He, but he also went to the cross and died for our sins. He paid the penalty of our sins. That anyone who would trust in him will be saved. In his grace, when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, he gave us life in Christ Jesus. So if you're here, if you're visiting, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, I invite you, don't leave this place without reconciling yourself to the God of the universe. And that is only possible in Christ Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the Lord of glory, who humbled himself to become like us so that he will make us like him. Brothers and sisters, let's hope in the Lord, even when we don't have reasons to have hope, because our hope is in him who gives life and creates out of nothing. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your grace and mercy in Christ. Thank you that our hope is unbreakable because it is grounded in you, the mighty one, the gracious one, the one who is love and majesty. Lord, I pray for anyone who is here, perhaps who has been running away from you, just going through the motions, hopeless today, I pray that you will bring those to you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who are struggling with hope, who think that they cannot make it. I pray that you will remind them that you are with them. And we, like Abraham, can hope even against hope because our hope is in you, O oh Lord. Thank you for your grace. In Christ we pray. Amen.